Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider. As I've said many times, Hawaii show about association living, both condominiums and homeowner associations, although probably we talk more about condos and the homeowner associations. And today we're going to talk a little bit about budget and reserves, but kind of the backdrop to that story is going to be the catastrophe in South Florida at the Surfside Condominium South which as we've all seen in the news over and over again, has collapsed, uh, killing hundreds. They're still searching for the bodies and very few survivors. And the two relevant things I wanna to talk to about that particular issue, uh, besides the, the great tragedy it is and the loss of life and, and all the things you would expect the one to say during a tragedy. Um, but basically, Two specific issues. One, structural integrity of buildings and spalling, and what does that all mean? Uh, although I have to say up front, there hasn't been any final conclusion made about what caused that building to collapse, but the evidence is pretty uh, significant of what probably caused that building to collapse. So we want to talk about what spalling is. And then number two, we want to talk about the reserves and what your obligations are to reserves, because you know Hawaii is an interesting state. We have a reserve law that requires condo boards and uh, to include in this budget reserve calculations and and collect the same from uh, the owners. Now, let's look at the surf side from this perspective for a minute. It was 156 units. And if you read the news, I'm going to round the numbers off. They were talking about a $16 million assessment or more, which is about $100,000 an owner. Well, what we find in Hawaii and everywhere in the country, people who live in condo never want to pay for anything. They want to have the low maintenance fees, never contribute to anything. And in this case, they had structural reports in 2018, three years before the tragedy, of severe concrete destruction. But what's interesting about spalling, and that's what I want to get into first, what is spalling? Excuse me a second. Um, spalling is the deterioration of the rebar inside the concrete. The structural stability of a concrete slab is the rebar. Now, if you think about it, you have the concrete slab or the concrete vertical or horizontal. In the case of decks, uh, like the pool deck at Surfside, a horizontal slab. The rebar provides the strength of that concrete from breaking apart. Well, all concrete is porous. The thickest concrete that I know of is 253 angstroms, and that's about 153 thousand of an inch of an angstrom. But that's porous enough that water will, over time, seep into the concrete and eventually get to the metal strengthening rod, the rebar in the middle, and cause it to rust. When rebar rusts, it expands. And that means the concrete has this enormous pressure from inside the rebar itself and causes the concrete to crack. And of course, as you get concrete to crack, Water gets in much easier, maybe considering allowing the rebar to rust even faster. Most concrete repair of rebar is common in all buildings. It's usually tied into the painting of the building. And most people, when they paint these concrete buildings, they paint them with an elastomeric paint, which is, I'm going to call it a plastic paint, that is a waterproofing material. I keep the water from getting in, but like anything exposed to the wind and the surf and the water and the, and the elements, over time, the, the thickness of that paint deteriorates. It has to be repainted again about every 10 years or so um, to maintain the waterproofing value of the elastomeric paint. It's not a paint is certainly cosmetic, but it's not the real purpose of elastomeric paint. It is to protect the concrete from water getting into it so you don't have spalling, which is the deterioration of the rebar within the concrete. Hope you've followed that so far. So anyway, when you look at rebar and deterioration, the earlier you catch the issue, 
the better off. So earlier detection of light cracking or problems, and there are certain tests they can do to uh, check for uh, spalling, usually done before painting. The earlier you deal with it, the less expensive it's going to be. Example would be if you catch rebar very early and you can chip it out and the rebar is only on the top because it's just starting to rust, you can very easily take the rust off and apply a, a corrosion protection on it and put the concrete back down and that piece of rebar is in perfect condition. If you wait too long, what happens is that rust goes around the entire rebar, so it's around the 360-degree circumference. And you now have the issue when you chip out the concrete, you just can't chip out to get to the top. You now got to chip out so you can expose the entire rod, both top and bottom, left and right, and then again uh, take off the rust and apply a, a corrosion material to it. Now, that is a much more expensive process than if you just had simple corrosion on the top of the rebar. But then the worst case would be you don't attend to the rust at all, and it eats away the rebar, and there's no rebar left to speak of. There's no strength left. Now you have the massive expense of providing structural integrity while you do the repair, replacing the rebar, which has a whole much more steps to it, and it is far more expensive. You know, when you look at the paper and just rounding off the numbers, the proposed assessment was $16 million for 156 owners in the Surfside condominium. And that was in 2018. And there is statements about unknown condition that might be worse. Well, if you look at that as a simple value, that's $100,000 an owner. That's a lot of money. Now, they would have to borrow it or assess it or whatever. And if they borrowed the money over a 10-year loan, which is typically the a commercial loan or at least the uh, period of time you can amortize a commercial loan for a major expense like $15 million, <clears throat> you'd be amortized over 20 years, but it's a 10-year uh, maximum fixed term, um, often less. You're talking about that assessment to each owner at over $1,000 a month. So to wait and wait and wait, it would have cost them $1,000 a month in this loan to pay for the repair. And of course, nobody wants to pay. They're on fixed incomes, a lot of seniors in that project. Um, and it can't be that bad is the mentality. I see it with condo boards here in Hawaii that nobody wants to address the reserve study in the way it was intended to be uh, implemented within the law. So anyway, if you go back and even forecast saying they realized 30 years ago they started to have a problem and they needed to save $16 million, that equates to about $250 a month for, per owner. That's a lot of money. But the probability is if they had repaired these items early, had dealt with these issues when they first got, like cancer, when they first got wind that there were some problems with the cracking of the building, it would have probably been a third of that cost or $50 a month per owner. So what do you have? You have a, a board that allegedly, uh, uh, they relied on the building experts of uh, South Florida, the governmental aid agencies. Uh, they looked at this. I don't, I haven't seen in the news anyone saying your building is in, catastrophic state that's going to fall down any minute. I think they're all saying it's just an expensive repair. But the boards who didn't want to do anything about it long ago and boards prior to that board and boards prior to that board kicked the can down the road were a simple $50 a month to the reserve fund and addressing the issue when it was identified would have been a far better solution for getting the lack of uh, the loss of life and the things we're dealing with at the Surfside Condominium. And so what you have to recognize when you start looking at the Surfside condominium, there were a lot of things that went wrong. One, uh, you know, Florida has a reserve law as well, by the way. Two, they had inklings of this for years and never did anything about it because of the cost. And three, when they started to do something about it, the cost became so exorbitant, nobody wanted to pay for it. And four, because they didn't act quick enough, 
there's been tremendous loss of life. And that's, that's a sad thing. And what is the odds of that happening here in Hawaii? Uh, I don't know, but you know, I've been doing reserve studies. Uh, some of you may know that I wrote part of the reserve law in Hawaii, and uh, I'm very involved in reserves and national statistics and national data. And so I often speak as an expert witness on lawsuits locally here on, on reserve study issues. But if they had just done a more prompt, conscientious job of maintaining their building, recognizing under Hawaii law anyway, you're a fiduciary, you have an obligation to maintain the building. It's not a choice. You have a fiduciary obligation to maintain it. And now we're going to see all the lawyers get rich because they're going to be arguing about uh, when you knew, what you knew, why you didn't do what you should have done. And, and, and the end result is, you know, you have ma- catastrophic loss of life and, and the loss of an entire building. And um, I don't know. I haven't talked to an insurance expert lately, but I'm not sure that the building is insured for lack of maintenance. We insure buildings under our insurance policies for perils, hurricanes, fires, you know, the things that happen. Water claims are covered under Hawaii uh, law uh, with the condominiums. But with regard to um, that building that has been now demolished, I'm not sure their insurance covers it. So all those owners may be out the total value or investment they have in that unit. And of course, uh, the mortgage holders who took as collateral the property. Uh, don't have any collateral anymore. And will some owners walk away from the mortgage companies and file bankruptcy? Who knows? It's, a, it's just a mess. And the truth of the matter is that Surfside's a perfect example of an association board of directors failing to exercise good business judgment and evaluate what the problems are in the building and maintain them timely. Because as I said earlier, the longer you wait on spalling repairs, the greater the number is going to be with respect to the cost of the repair. And it's not nominal amounts of money because uh, in workers' comp world, uh, people who work on buildings, high rises, and deal with spalling are one of the highest work comp rates in the country. So it's not a cheap repair. And I've seen a lot of associations say, that's not that bad. I just get a handyman to put some more concrete on it. But that's not going to stop the rusting. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a serious problem. So you've got to attend to the building and all of its issues, not just spalling and painting and roofing and the rest of it. You have to tend to them timely by putting these things into a reserve study and collecting adequate funds so you can repair these things and avoid these types of catastrophes. Now, on that note, I've kind of set the stage for part two of the show. We're going to talk about the Hawaii's statutory obligations for reserves and the types of reserve studies. So we'll be right back in one minute. America Finding Its Way is a 30-minute talk show from Think Tech Hawaii, which is streamed live at 11 o'clock every Thursday morning. The show features Jay Fidel as host with regular contributors Tim Apicella, Cynthia Sinclair, Stephanie Dalton and Winston Welch. We discuss the issues, events, challenges and crises in Washington and around the country and the world, in the federal and state governments, in the cities and in the hinterland. We examine and evaluate the motivations and frustrations of the competing individuals and interests these days. We connect the dots, we tell the truth, and we try to figure out what it all means and where things are going. In short, we cover America finding its way in the post-Trump world which is not easy and which is sometimes a discouraging experience. We try to be optimistic, but we are often left pessimistic about the future of our country. Come watch us, listen to us, email your questions to us at questions at thinktechhawaii.com every Thursday morning, and you'll see what we mean. Thanks. Well, I'm back, and uh, I pretty much set the stage in the first part of the show about uh, using the Surfside condominium as an example, uh, the potential risk of failure to maintain your building. And what I was going to say as I was ending that is that I'm sure all those individual directors, current and past, are going to be sued as a part of this process as the attorneys get a, get a hold of this, and uh, they start looking at all the issues and trying to find all the insurance they can, they can get. Certainly, I said that I don't think the building structure itself is covered by that catastrophe. 
but I uh, do think their direct and offshore liability insurance, if they have it, will cover them to some level. But you know, you're talking about a huge economic cost that I'm sure that there are limits of liability and their insurance aren't going to cover it. But let's just review what the obligations are in Hawaii. And to keep it simple, the state law says you have to do a budget every year. That's clear. And you have to distribute it to the owners every year. It's clear. And boards usually go into that and say, initially, I don't want to raise the maintenance fees. Well, that's not so clear. Let's think of it this way. Associations are nonprofits. That means they don't make profit. They don't have retained earnings. They're collecting just enough money from the homeowners to pay the bills and fund the reserves. So if costs go up, like in your medical insurance for your employees or your property insurance because of all the fires in California, which do affect local insurance rates, by the way. And your vendors charge you more and your utility company raise the rates. Why wouldn't you think there's some inflationary pressure just to maintain break even to raise your rates on an inflationary level on an annual basis? Granted, there's going to be some exceptions if there's something, some immediate cost savings you, you find you didn't have before. Maybe you put a cellular antenna on your roof and that provides income you didn't have and helps subsidize some of the inflationary increases in the short run. But the reality of it is if you have to do a budget, you should expect that there should be reasonable inflationary increases in the budget. Now, as I was saying, the budget shall include a reserve study. That means that you don't have an option whether you want to do a reserve study or not. Now, certainly you can hire a professional or the board can do it themselves on an Excel spreadsheet. There's all sorts of things you can do, but the reserve law says you have to do a reserve study. And it has, says you have to identify in the administrative rules every individual replacement item in your building with a value of over $1,000. So that means your doorknobs on your common element doors your light fixtures in the hallway, your fans in the, in the rec room, all of these things have to be included in the reserve study. And you're supposed to be planning to collect enough from uh, the owners uh, to collect that. As a little side story, you might know that in 1990, back when, believe it or not, Maisie Hirono, Senator Hirono, was uh, in the, the House. She was on the Consumer Protection Committee. She was instrumental of setting up the reserve law here in Hawaii, along with the other legislators. And it said as of January 1, 2000, they gave you a grace period to get to a period of what they call, this was 1995, 50% funded. Well, they realized after they passed that law in 95 that that in reserve study world, there's two types of reserve studies. Uh, One basis, it's analysis on a percentage, the other on a cash flow. Uh, the most prevalent way is cash flow. Almost 98% of the condos in the world use the, that method. Well, they didn't provide for it in the law. So in 1997, the law was amended to provide for what we call cash flow funding. Now, those aren't reserve studies, cash flow and percent funded. Those are funding models. The reserve studies are called pooling and component method, which I'm not going to get into too much detail on today. But the reality of it is you have to do this reserve study, which requires you to look at all the items over $1,000, you can pool them as a group. So you could say pool equipment, which consists of the pump, the filter, et cetera, and make that one item instead of defining the pool and the pump separately. But you, you have to do a reserve study. And what I find is that boards sometimes start saying, well, I don't want to deal with that. You know, uh, uh, I think that we'll get another 10 years out of the roof or we'll get another 20 years out of the air conditioning system. And they put unrealistic numbers in so that that calculation of the reserve contribution is lower than it should be. When I look at national statistics and locally statistics specifically, and I look at high-rise buildings, which will be different than a townhouse and small little CPR condos. When I look at those, the average contribution for reserves falls between $150 to $250 a unit per month. So that means within your budget, you should have between 150, if the the statistics apply to you, 
you should be somewhere between 150 and 250 dollars a month going to reserves and you should be putting that money into the reserves every month in a separate segregated savings account to save that money and whether it's 150 or 250 is going to depend on the reserve study and you identifying all the components if you have a lot of amenities gyms dog parks all these different things high end for furniture in your lobby it's going to be more closer to 250 if you're more of a bare bones condominium and there's some uh, reserved housing type condominiums out there that the, the number may be closer to 150 dollars what i see all the time happen is that condo boards say i don't want to deal with that and they come up with a number to put in the reserves and that cash flow plan the 20 year analysis shows that every year you have to raise the contributions to reserves. So what they do for this year is they get by and say, okay, that's what we're going to do this year. And they kick the can down the road. And next year, where they've already admitted, they say increase the reserve contributions. They find a way not to do it by saying the roof's going to last longer or the paint's going to last longer, it may be. And if anything, the South Florida incident to tell us that there's a price to living in a condominium and maintaining it, and that we should be very judicious and putting some serious attention to the reserve study so you don't have these types of problems. So I'm an expert in several cases involving reserves. And the problem is, is that even on new projects, developers um, provide a number and they say it's an estimate. Well, you know, on new projects, the problem doesn't go away. Because the statute condominium, I think it's 514B-9, but don't hold me to it, uh, says it has to be an accurate estimate of, reserve, of, of, of estimates. So if they use numbers that are just made up or, or really they can't validate when you realize all these people have the same resources available to them, they'll have a professional managing agent maybe. They will have um, uh, national statistics, certainly. Get them on Google. You'll have like condominiums here in Hawaii, that if you have a managing agent, they should be able to give you uh, uh, examples of what other condominiums are, are doing. Although you have to understand they may not be doing the right job either. So their, their numbers may not be perfect. But you can look at this and just say to yourself, how much are you putting in reserves? And if you're putting in 30 dollars $40, $50 a month for your reserves, I assure you, you're not doing a good job if you're a high-rise condominium. You're not going to have enough money to fix these items when, when they come due. So kind of the message I have today is, is that once a year, we all give, are given a clean state. We can do our budget and our reserve study. And so we should be judicious in looking at the real costs. We should be judicious in looking at the reserve study and the impact it has on uh, your building and maintaining your building. Not your maintenance fees, but how it impacts you properly to maintain the building. Because it's certainly a bit easier for South Florida if they saw they had spalling 10 years ago and they had put charged more on a monthly basis and they had a couple of million bucks in the bank and they could deal with it then and preserve and protect the building, which is gone now. And at the same time, have done it in a more business judgment, judicious way by charging, as I used in my example, $50 more a month per reserve by accurately and properly doing your reserve study with regard to uh, the obligation. But as kind of a reminder, uh, reserve studies are a requirement by Hawaii law. They have to be done annually as a part of your update of your annual budget. They have to be distributed to the owners. You have to identify all the components, their useful lives, remaining lives, estimated replacement costs. You have to apply re- inflation to those costs. And you have to, uh, when, in the segregated fund you're saving, uh, apply the interest earnings. So you have kind of a whole picture when, when you look at the whole thing. And I'm sad and it's tragic what happened in Florida, but it should be a lesson in history for all of us of the importance of doing a proper job on your reserve study. And that may mean bringing in architects and engineers at times. It may mean hiring a professional if your project is big and your volunteer boards don't have the resources to put together a good plan under the current statute. And I can assure you, if you don't, at the end of the day, you're going to find out that uh, you're going to have major assessments which will protect your value. You're going to have all the same fights the Surfside had about 
I don't think it's that bad. We don't need to do it now and that type of a thing. So I would just encourage you all to use this moment in history, realizing the tragedy we wouldn't want to have happen to anybody, but realizing that you have, the board member, the chance to correct the road you might be on. And I would tell you there are some associations that do a very good job at this, but you have the chance to correct the road you're on because if we don't, I can assure you the dark side is going to interfere. Our legislature is going to get involved and they're going to pass laws and require engineering inspections and require you to spend more money to do what you should be doing anyway. So on that note, I'm going to thank you for watching Condo Insider. I hope you have a good day and we hope you tune in next week to another edition of Hawaii show about associations, Condo Insider. Aloha.